Mr. Vice Minister, thank you so much for spending time with me this afternoon. Thank you for having me. I wanted to start by asking you about your meetings, which you just wrapped up with Foreign Minister Jorge Arriaza of Venezuela. We are here in Caracas after all. And when I spoke with the Foreign Minister earlier this year, we discussed the importance of Venezuela Russia relations and especially how vital Russian support has been as Venezuela resists this current U.S. attempt to implement regime change here. What did you two discuss in your meeting and what brings Venezuela and Russia together? Starting with your last question, we uh, discussed at some length uh, what we both learned from the conference here which is uh, not that little. People who came here managed to bring with them their own agendas, but they're also very united in defense of multilateralism and also sending a message that uh, uh, people should have an opportunity, a chance to resolve their own problems, figure out of their own mess on their own without any efforts from powerful forces abroad to impose some solutions. Uh, besides, there were very interesting exchanges uh, in the corridors of the conference, uh, particularly on Middle East issues and uh, on some developments in Asia, in Southeastern Asia, where troubles are growing and uh, we try to make sure that we understand the general mood and some specifics along the same lines. Secondly, we discussed some particular aspects of our bilateral Russian-Venezuelan cooperation, which is ongoing, and it is very wrong to presume that uh, all these crises and difficulties that this country experience, uh, that it just, you know, bars any cooperation. That's not true. Uh, in some cases, it even, uh, you know, stimulates uh, deeper co deeper cooperation in practical terms and this is very good and number three we also exchanged to some extent on uh, the Barbados outcome of the round in Barbados and I benefited a lot from his insights on the conference uh, and how you believe uh, the situation brings Russia and Venezuela together uh, I think uh, there is nothing to hide we do not have any hidden agendas in a sense uh, we try to make sure that uh, both our countries figure out how to sustain very considerable pressures from abroad and it's not just US, there are many more. In case of Venezuela, uh, it's very regrettable that the number of immediate neighbors and close neighbors, they also adopted a very, very focused policy of pressurizing uh, Venezuela. In our case, there are several others, including European Union uh, and countries uh, of non-regional character, so to say. Uh, we want to make sure that we find ways how to bypass restrictions that are being imposed, how to, well, I wouldn't say benefit, that would be an overstatement, but at least minimize negative effects through uh, well, for instance, substitution of important, imported goods. In case of Russia, it is very relevant, especially in such areas like uh, agriculture, food processing, and things like this. We, we have achieved, you can see it on the shelves uh, of the shops, that many more made in Russia things are uh, uh, there. So, uh, in a sense, we brought production back home. It resembles me something. Uh, we want make sure that we make Russia great again. The Non-Aligned Movement was originally created to provide an organization for countries which didn't line up behind one superpower or the other during the Cold War. Uh, yet here we are, almost 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Russia now is an observing member of NAM. What does it mean for Russia to participate in the group? And what is the significance of NAM today in 2019? You know, we have never uh, 
in recent decades we have never been driven by the desire to acquire once again uh, a great power status as such, nor much less so, I would say, to re-establish what is called Russian Empire. It's out of question, it's, it has no connection to reality and it's just, you know, phantoms if anyone in entertains such ideas. They can never be implemented. What we tried to do uh, was to benefit from partnerships of a very different character, not ideologically driven partnerships. Uh, I will reject the idea that countries like Venezuela, Iran, Syria, North Korea, China, Russia, whoever, are unified through whatever ideology, because it, it, they are very different, all of them. Uh, and we only uh, work together as close as we do because we face similar challenges and even similar threats, threats to sovereignty. I think uh, it's very real when people here uh, talk a lot on the policies of regime change. I hate finger pointing but that sense of danger is very real and many people uh, have uh, a very clear uh, I would say uh, impression that um, countries uh, of the historic West, they kind of concluded that now is the moment or a period of opportunity to find ways how to contain the emerging powers, how to make them weaker, how to remove uh, you know obstacles in forms of less influential countries. This is um, very unfortunate and uh, this is contrary to the tendencies in the international relationship that we think will prevail. Diversity and freedom of choices, like in societies, I should I think should be the predominant factor in international relationship and we want to promote this and thus we are associated with Venezuela and we mutually support each other and we try to make sure that uh, you know everyone understands that in our case with Venezuela there are no there is no such thing as a hidden agenda after the collapse of the Soviet Union there was an emergence in Western political and diplomatic thought that we'd reach the end of history and that for the coming years the United States would be able to act freely as the world's sole superpower. Yet that didn't necessarily happen even though the Soviet Union, Russia, changed its economic system, is now part of the capitalist world there's still a tension there. So why didn't things change? And what is the root of tension now? You know, it's very hard to speculate on uh, what and when and why. Uh, I always uh, follow with interest people who try to say that Russia behaved uh, on the so-called wrong side of history or found herself together with some uh, not on the right side of history as if those people are prophets from the Old Testament and they all know what will happen next. This is very strange. We are agnostics in a sense. Uh, we know for sure what is right for us and we cannot say that uh, anyone else knows better. This is one of the fundamental disconnects that exist right now and uh, it is completely unrelated to any ideology and I think this is the basis why uh, in many ways the modern Russia with all the uh, attributes of capitalism and you know I would even dare to say more and more hedonistic way of living of people especially young people that it still believes that uh, it's their these people and this country own choice. It's not so that uh, an empire, in a sense, grew to an extent that the whole world is now uh, a uniform world. That's, uh, it, it's against the mentality of a Russian. I mean, it's, it's still, it sits with people who live in my country that uh, they should be masters of their own fate and their own country. A major theme of this non-aligned movement summit has been 
sanctions or the impact of U.S.-led unilateral coercive measures on countries all around the world. The Trump administration is relying on sanctions and economic warfare, what the Iranian foreign minister describes as economic terrorism, more than at any point before in history. Why do you think that's the primary weapon of the United States at this moment? Hard to judge on uh, why. Uh, what I know for sure is that uh, in recent time the culture of negotiation, the pattern of compromise became almost completely absent from the toolbox of the US uh, diplomacy and foreign policy altogether. Uh, now the question is why. I think uh, my own judgment uh, on this would be because uh, after the end of the Cold War uh, it took particularly long for uh, US uh, to realize that uh, there is no such thing like everyone agreeing to what US asks or demands uh, and generations changed and if the US in their diplomacy want to rebuild uh, some form of give and take culture, some form of business-like uh, compromised focused effort, then they should start almost from scratch. That's quite a problem. Uh, and I'm not sure it will happen. So in absence of these sophisticated tools, uh, the next uh, cost-efficient one would be sanctions before resort to raw force, military force. And this is how they proliferate sanctions all over the world. We made our analysis and we concluded that uh, altogether close to 70 countries were subject to US sanctioning in recent decades. It's more than uh, one third of the whole humanity. It's huge. I think it will f uh, backfire. It cannot be sustained this way and it's quite I would say damaging for the US to continue uh, this wave of you know moving uh, those who oppose anything and not talking to them apart and aside and trying to you know work with sanctions in order to you know impress people who do not understand quote unquote and do you find that in any sense even your European counterparts feel as though the United States is getting carried away probably not no at least not in case of Russia. With Iran, for example? Well, uh, they have their own views on things, but ultimately I think they will follow the US. I was reflecting recently and I realized that it was almost exactly a year ago, give or take a few days, that I was in Helsinki covering the historic summit between Presidents Trump and Putin. A moment when so many people were hopeful and optimistic that there could be an improvement in relations between the two countries. What has changed since then and why have those initiatives seemingly fallen apart? Uh, last year's meeting between the leaders uh, was uh, very good in terms of atmospherics and in terms of how they talked and how they understood each other. But it was uh, a moment after which uh, a very rapid further deterioration followed, which was extremely unfortunate. We couldn't believe our own eyes and ears when we heard point after point how uh, understandings between the leaders were literally dismantled in Washington. So this year in Osaka, Japan, uh, they talked again business, they did so in a very focused way, especially on arms control and economy. And as of now, we didn't see uh, similar attempts uh, of the establishment in Washington to wipe it out. We do not see, which is good. And we have now a uh, restart of engagement uh, on several issues uh, between Moscow and Washington, including arms control in particular, which I formally stand for. We are hopeful we will get some tracking. We have specific ideas, we have shared those with the US, and especially in light of the uh, rapidly approaching expiration of the term of New START, we need to focus more on this. And we, Russia, we are very prepared. So hopefully this time we will not uh, 
fail like we did at our level uh, after the Helsinki summit of last year. During a meeting today of states which have grouped together in order to reaffirm their commitment and the importance of the UN's founding principles in, in, in the charter, original charter, self-determination, sovereignty, you gave an intervention in which you specifically spoke about the need to develop alternatives to the U.S. dominated financial system. You spoke about the need for multipolarity in terms of currency, specifically moving away from a, a dollar hegemony. What steps are countries like Russia and China taking to make that future a possible reality? I am very convinced that the moment has come where uh, the political abuse of the centrality of dollar became uh, obvious for many countries and many economic actors all over the world. Uh, I think this is one of the worst things that happened to the US and the US uh, establishment altogether that it miscalculated the negative effects of this arbitrary use of sanctions and that policy of blackmailing everyone if they behave not the way the U.S. wants. Because we know the U.S. Uh, will be uh, the economic superpower for an infinite future, I believe. This is different from the role in the world, but economically that would be a huge and uh, indispensable uh, segment, chunk of the world uh, for we don't know how long, but it doesn't, e it doesn't equal to the fact that uh, people will continuously use dollar and the US financial system as the, you know, cardiovascular system of the whole organism. That will not be the case. People will bypass in, in literal term and people will find ways how to defend themselves, how to protect themselves, how to guarantee themselves against any emergencies. If someone uh, come up at the White House or whatever, at the Treasury or at the state and say, hey guys, now we should stop what is going on in country X and let's squeeze them out. And this country sits on dollar. So they will be done the moment uh, those uh, ideas will be pronounced. So China, Russia, others, we at the moment create alternatives. Then we will most probably move further into using not just national currencies, but baskets of currencies, currencies of third countries, other schemes, uh, modern barter schemes are among those, but th those are not sophisticated enough. But still, we will use ways that would diminish the role of dollar and US banking system with all this risk of assets uh, and transactions being arrested, being stopped. Thank you again so much. Thank you.